you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, today, as you know, most of you would know that it's uh, church celebrates Pentecost Sunday, and it's in honor of what happened in Acts chapter 2. So if you'd go there with me, and however you're reading your Bible, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Talking about the winds of change, that was a big one there, and it continues to blow across our land. The, ru the sound of the rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Then I'm going to drop down to verse 39, and it says, This promise, the promise, is for you and your children. It's interesting, we just sang what we sang, that blessing song. Thank you, Isaac, for leading us in that with such power. For you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Say this with me. The Pentecostal anointing is for me. I want to use, uh, that's the name of my message this morning, Pentecostal anointing, and I want to use Pentecostal as an adjective, not a noun. And we know that in our day, the Pentecostals and the Pentecostal music and Pentecostal this, um, Pentecostal denomination, it's, uh, it's more of a description of a, it's like a noun. But um, the Pentecostal anointing, when I refer to it that way, rather than saying Pentecostal power, I think the anointing makes us think a little different about it. It did, did me. And we can see that um, the Pentecostal anything takes us back to this day that we're honoring. The day when he came in like a mighty wind, like a rushing wind. I suppose if they would have had trains in that day, a train would have been in there somewhere that he sounded like a train arriving, a mighty, long, powerful train, and the wind blowing and the, and the, and the tongues uh, alighting on each one of them is a big deal. So um, it's fitting for us to review this story. It's fitting for us to rejoice that we who are far off get to be recipients of that promise of the Holy Spirit and it's also fitting for us to recalibrate our view of what that means we're called to do and able to do. Because sometimes we get to be a, a little bit too, we take things for granted. And I hope that you're realizing we live in a nation today where some of the things we took for granted are being challenged and we're not, it's just not a sure thing. So, you know, part of the winds of change, the change of uh, uh, is, uh, brings an uncertainty, but some of the, of the um, negative, the uh, things that are undermining the foundations of this nation need to change. And there needs to be an uncertainty about that remaining, about a more abortion remaining legal in the land. That needs to change. There needs to be an uncertainty about whether that's going to happen or not. Guess what? Mississippi has a case in the Supreme Court be pr praying for that case to succeed because it could, it could undermine that whole legality that they said was in the Constitution of it's legal to take a baby's life at any point in the pregnancy. Uh, that, has, that has to be challenged. And of all people that should challenge it, the Lord's church should be challenging it and say, look, this status quo is not going to stay that way, not on our watch. We're going to rise up in every way that we can spiritually, physically, mentally, spiritually, uh, spiritually giving, uh, and our way we vote, the way we act, the way we speak, and we're going to stand against this thing. It's just uh, shedding of innocent blood is a bad, bad deal. Opens a bad, bad door into things that we're, we're reaping the harvest of it in our nation. And it, that door needs to be shut. So anyway, on that day, the freshly anointed Apostle Peter stood up with the eleven, it says, and to the amazed and perplexed and to the wondering and the mocking, it says he raised his voice. And he said, These are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine in the morning. This is the Peter who had just got through denying Jesus not many days before, had been called back to Jesus 
especially he said go get the disciples and Peter don't leave Peter out he'll he'll hang back and he'll wallow in his depression and his his discouragement about his failure until he ends up like Judas hanging from a tree go get Peter make sure Peter comes he's coming back he's the leader of this group and uh, and Jesus wouldn't let him uh, wallow and, and give up so Peter stands up being freshly anointed with the Pentecostal anointing hallelujah raised his voice and he said to the Jews mostly Jews but they're, they're into, in Jerusalem from all different regions and areas and he said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I like the way the old King James says it. This is that. And he grounds it in the scripture, grounds it in the prophetic that they, they knew well so that there could be no argument as to the explanation of what was going on with these tongue talkers and these people that were so jubilant they were acting drunk. And, and like Dan said, they were acting like their, their favorite team won the game and there wasn't even a game. And, and so... Um, it's just, uh, it's just an unusual uh, thing that Peter has to bring some light to uh, and, and point them to what Joel said. This is the fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost, the promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the anointing to live and do as God's representatives. Uh, last week there was treasure hunts that uh, Matt and I think Rachel helped lead or Anyway, the, the teams went out and uh, ministered as they were led by the Holy Spirit. And I asked Judith to share her testimony of what the Lord did in that situation. Come on, Judith, and bring a testimony. Because this is a very real, real anointing that helps us. Uh, here's, here's what the Lord is, um, is telling me. Uh, I said, Lord, I need to I know your plan. I need to know what to do when I get there. He said, um, you're anointed. The anointing is within you. When you get there, do as the occasion demands. I'm going, you mean it's a need-to-know basis? And he said, well, you know, you're the airplane. The pilot's in the plane. The plane don't need to know the plan. The plane just needs to let the pilot fly it. And so for somebody like me, now for somebody's other, it's not to say you don't study and you don't, you don't make plans. This is to say that when you show up, things are going to happen that you need to have an anointing to deal with. Go ahead, Judith. Well, first of all, I've never, never done this, never done treasure hunt. John Larry always wanted to, so I had to really dedicate my day to, Lord, you got to make it work out. So he rearranged my schedule so I could be here because, you know, I live in Florida, guys, right? So I was with a great group of young people that had all the energy that I needed and I was the oldest one and you know it didn't bother me because they not only honored me they appreciated me and I was the one that had the knowledge that because he gives us good history about how this church started and I needed that history we were had two employees were what we thought were highlighted because they had the green so God was faithful he gave me all the clues we our little team had Bass Pro Shop, so I got Bass Pro Shop, green shirt, stripe, military, three-generational unforgiveness. And we kept going to these two employees that were older gentlemen. And as, as um, we just, okay, these are them. They got the green. They're the, at the boats. We're there. And, and, and the one guy said, yeah, you can pray for us. And I kept expecting him to do this. <laughs> And the other man got real serious. I think his name was David, right, guys? David. He looked at me. He said, well, what church are you from? I said, Hope Fellowship. What kind of church is that? As an old Baptist, where I got saved, I'm so used to that. All right. I said, <clears throat> our church came out of Crossgates Baptist Church. Our pastor did Sunday school, and they were a part of it for years, and our church formed out of him being asked to, da-da, and we're covered by Bethel. Bethel, what's that? It's a church in California. Who covers them? They're covered. I just went with that. But my clue was, my, my word that was what was from the Holy Spirit was, we came out of. Because he said, oh, my membership's there. I don't go anymore. That was the Lord. 
So they allowed us to pray for them. And we gave them our card and invited him. And, and he said, well, what's different about you? I said, well, we believe just like you. We believe the Holy Spirit is real. And he does all these things that Jesus did. And what Jesus did, we can do. And he looked at me. He said, hmm. And so when we were leaving just to confirm, and it went well. It went well, and, and, and Annie, uh, Annie prayed for another person, I, Ivory, that she had a relationship with that had been shot, that had a bullet pass through, or another employee. So, you know, I was just feeling good that the God didn't shoo us completely off and allowed us to pray for him. So we're leaving the building. We're kind of having our little congregation, and just to bless us, this 20-year-old that got saved three years ago gave us this incredible testimony. Matthew, if you're here, wave your hand. He's incredible. He was incredible, but I had to ask him, where do you go to church? You know where he went. Cross gates. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. The Holy Spirit really sets some things up when you uh, take the risk in him and um, are led by him to do to live and to do uh, as God's representatives knowing that the anointing has empowered us and enabled us to do that the Pentecostal anointing and so um, when Peter presented uh, this from the uh, uh, prophecy of Joel to them and he uh, began to share with them um, about how Jesus was both the Lord and Christ and that he'd been crucified at their hands and condemned to death and then uh, crucified they began to cry out what, 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 what must we do what must we do and, he, and Peter gave an invitation on the day of Pentecost Acts 2.38 and he said repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit it wasn't just um, Peter wasn't just on the day of Pentecost when he'd come in like a mighty rushing wind and he'd uh, anointed each of them with tongues of fire. Peter wasn't just uh, talking about a gift of the Holy Spirit that will indwell you, which happens when you're saved. When you're regenerated, when you become a new creature in Christ, he does indwell you. But Peter wasn't leaving it at that, believe me. He was referring to a Holy Spirit of power that you have no doubt something has shifted in your life. Some wind of change has blown in to where now you're completely different. People who say, well, I got saved, but nothing really changed. I said, well, let's do that again then. Because if you really got saved, something should have changed. There should be something about your life that you can point to that say the God of the universe by His Spirit has moved into me, and I know the difference. And so um, sometimes we need to look at that and not just be churchgoers, but be those who are personally anointed by Pentecostal power. So um, Peter answered that question by saying you will receive, you will be baptized if you repent, if you turn away from what you've been believing, what you've been doing, change the way you think, be water baptized, symbolic of dying in Christ and being raised to new life, and then you will be filled and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he said um, then um, that day, Acts 2.38, uh, where he referred to that, but uh, 10 years later, about 10 years later, we have what we call the Gentile Pentecost that happened in Cornelius' house. Cornelius, you know the story, had sent for Peter because an angel had appeared to him. This was a lost uh, man who was faithful in praying, faithful in giving. Some lost people give better and pray better than the Christians do. Hallelujah. But um, no, I shouldn't have said hallelujah there. I should have said, oh me, oh my. And, uh, but this man did, and it came up. The angel said as a memorial before God, and he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to send for Peter and Joppa and bring him. And, of course, Peter had that experience with the Lord where he was in a trance and things came down. Sheets came down to show him that God had made things that were formerly locked out. They were now part of this whole new covenant, part of this whole plan. So Peter came willingly with the, with the messengers, and he begins to present the gospel. And as he was presenting the story of Jesus... Uh, we know the Holy Spirit fell on them and he said it's and, and the Jews that had come with him said it's happened to them just as it happened to us the wind the tongues of fire the at least tongues they began to speak in tongues even as it happened to them uh, on the day of Pentecost 
And they said, well, what, what prevents us from baptizing them with water? So the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the speaking in tongues came first, then the water baptism in that case, called the Gentile Pentecost. And during that uh, message that Peter was giving them, he, he described what it looks like when you function and have an unction out of the Pentecostal anointing. And he used Jesus as an example. What better example to use? And in Acts 10.38, he had spoke, you know, in Acts 2.30, but in Acts 10.38, he said, How God anointed, this is how it looks, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power or oppressed by the devil, because God was with him. And so Peter says, this is what it's going to look like when you have come under or when you have been anointed with that Pentecostal anointing. It's going to look like something. You're going to go about being the devil's worst nightmare. And you're going to be uh, causing indifference because you've stepped into the situation. And you're going to change atmospheres because you showed up. Because you've got something on you called the Pentecostal anointing. If you got saved, He indwells you. If you've asked for more, He wants to, as we sang this morning, He wants to overflow you and let His light shine and His salt bring a savor into the situation that was formerly not there before. So 25 or so years afterward, near the end of his life, Peter wrote in his second letter from Rome to the churches of Asia Minor. And in that letter, he reminded them of, uh, and us through that letter that through Christ's glory and goodness, we were all called and given His very great and precious promises. In fact, he said, because of these, you have become partakers of the divine nature. You're no longer dealing with just your nature. You're no longer dealing with just the human nature. Well, it's just human nature for your sin. Well, you ain't got just the human nature, forgive my English. You haven't got just your power to live free. You are anointed with a Pentecostal anointing and it goes back to an empowerment that not only sets you free, but gives you the ability to walk in the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus and free those, others, who are oppressed by the devil. So Jesus described it this way. He said, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. We are anointed to be like salt, to function like salt. Salt and uh, many of you probably know more that, that cook and, and, and uh, bake and stuff. You probably know more about what salt does than I do. But I know my wife, one of the common phrases I hear when she puts a meal on the table, she said, now it needs a little salt. You got to put a little more salt on it. I didn't salt it quite enough. Why would she do that? It's because she wants her food to be flavored to where it's tasty, to where it's attractive, to where, it, to where I have a problem with my weight. And so I, I blame her. She wasn't such a good cook. Literally, this is not, this is not speaking evangelistically, evangelistically. I weighed uh, 20 pounds more two weeks after I got married. And it's because she'd learned to cook like a Cajun. And I grew up in Kansas where spices didn't exist, apparently, <laughs> except for dill. And uh, mom would make a roast, put dill on it. I'm going, okay, well. I didn't know, and I came down south, and I was tasting all these flavors. My taste buds was exploding, and I couldn't put the food. I couldn't stop, you know. I call it my salvation glance, just kept salvating. She said, don't use that word, please, and I said, okay. But, um, but I just kept pulling in, uh, I did, and so now I've got to have self-control, and that's difficult. It's better when the food doesn't taste good. I have more self-control. So uh, I don't know if you found that or not. But salt is good, Jesus said, but if it loses its saltiness, Mark 9, 50, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. And so Jesus seems to make it say, seems to say that we're called to be salt, but there is this possibility. I don't even know if it's actually possible in the natural, but he said salt can lose its flavor. Salt can just be a white substance. And he said, when it becomes that way, it's good for nothing except to be cast out and trod under the feet of men. I read somewhere that they actually used salt that had lost, well, I don't know whether it lost its savor, but they used salt for, to pave the roads in Rome uh, during that day. 
And so it was actually trod under the feet of men. And I assume because it was also a very valuable, valuable uh, thing, they were using it for uh, exchange of, uh, uh, like financial exchange. It was also a representative of, of covenant. It was being put into the offerings at the temple. Almost every offering had to be seasoned with salt. So it was valuable, so probably it had lost its savor for it to end up as a road pavement. So there's this possibility that we, Jesus said, as, the, as His church who have been anointed with Pentecostal power, yet we can get into a situation, we can get into a place where we've lost our savor. We've lost what we can bring into the situation. We've lost what kind of impact we can make because something has gone uh, wrong with what, who we are. It's not that you're not salt anymore. It's just that your salt has lost its purpose. And uh, you lack what you need to bring the kind of change into place. Salt is a preserving agent. It stops the decay and the corruption that, as Peter said, is in the world through evil, evil desires. God placed us in spheres of influence to season them. You say, well, that's the worst place I've ever worked. Well, guess why you're there? And you know, sometimes it's not being a big super spiritual person and you've got a scripture for everything. It's bringing an ability to defuse the bomb. Those two are about to kill each other. Let me see if I can bring some peace in the situation. Uh, when I worked in the, in the aerospace industry, it was interesting because um, there was a bad name for Christians because of some people that had worked before me and they had tried to milk the company. They believed that they were spiritually superior to where they didn't really have to work to get a paycheck. Now, man, there's some crazy doctrines out there, but that is, that is not biblical. You should be the best, most dependable employee, at least doing your best. So your employer would point to you if he said, I want some just like him, maybe trained a little better, but just like him. But I walked in that situation, and there were some that were just uh, mad at me uh, because of some other guys. And it took me years um, of just living in front of them and doing things. I really did it with a wrong motive. I read somewhere in the scriptures that you can serve them and it's like piling coals of fire on their head. And so I really wanted to pile coals of fire on their head, but I couldn't do it without serving them. So they'd go to wash their hands in the sink and I'd roll the paper towels down for them. How do you like them coals, buddy? I wouldn't say that. But... <laughs> They'd be moving something heavy. I'd get over there and I'd help them, you know, have some coals there, man. But, um, so, but the Lord honored it anyway. And uh, over the years, they began to shift and they began to uh, come to me in, in, in their desperate situations. One man asked me, he said, can, uh, he said will you uh, give me some words I can say to my father? He said, I'm going to visit him on the coast. He's in the hospital. He's just got a few days to live. He said, I want him to go to heaven. I don't know what to say. I said, well, let me tell you, Tommy. Your dad needs to know Jesus, and here's what you say. Had another guy who said, I've, I've got to make a decision. He said, I've been offered a great, great opportunity. And he said, but I've got a good job here, and I don't know whether to take it or not. And uh, he said, would you pray for me? This guy had been a big harassment. He had been in my face. And it, but it, it came around. When I, two years before I left, they gave me a raise in that department for being the, the chaplain of the department. They don't have a position for that. They, um, the, uh, the director and the, uh, the supervisor and the manager and anyway, I've, the Lord had arranged where there were four levels deep were Christians. And they came to me the last year and they said, we heard you're starting a church because for two years I worked while I passed, while I got this church, while we got this church going. And they said, we want you to know that we want to do everything possible to help you do that. I have my own office, which was not supposed to happen at that level. It was supposed to be in a bullpen with a lot of phones. I had my own phone, had my own computer. And they let me have the flexibility of doing funerals, doing weddings, being off, being on, working whenever I could work. And the Lord just blessed it. But it's because I went in there and I said, I'm called to be salt. I wasn't thinking this way. I just knew that this is, this is how it's supposed to be. I'm, I'm called to be salt. And because I was there, that department became a better department. And because you're somewhere, it's supposed to make it better. Because we're in this city, 
is supposed to be a better city because we're in this nation. See, Abraham said, Lord, if I can five, find ten righteous, is that enough seasoning to spare Gomorrah? God said it would be. doesn't take a lot of salt, just takes some. But he couldn't find it. So he delivered Lot and his family and destroyed the city. But because we're here, because we're in this nation, because we, there are salt being restored to its flavor in the day we're in, there's the remnant of the church rising up into its responsibility as the ecclesia, and they're stepping into the authority that was given to them through Pentecostal anointing. And because of that, we're, we're having an impact where this nation can be saved. Not because the nation becomes Christian, but because there's enough salt in it that it can preserve it. It can keep it from decaying and corrupting to where it's completely destroyed. We have a Pentecostal anointing to do that. Jesus said also in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, He said, you're the light of the world. You're a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So Jesus said, you're, you're here to be a beacon. You're here to be a lighthouse. You're here to, because of the uh, truth you know, because of the revelation you've received, you can speak into the darkness and you can help deliver out of the darkness people who will heed your warning, people who will heed your wisdom, people who will respond to the Word of God that you carry. You'll be like a light. You'll be like a city. In fact, in Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2, he says, Rise and shine. You know, for the glory of God, the Pentecostal anointing has already come on you. Rise and shine, and he says on into that verse, even as darkness grows around you, as gross darkness is upon the people. He said, if you'll rise and shine, he said, I'll draw even the kings of the nation, those with influence, those in governmental positions, will be drawn to someone who's not just a revolutionary, but they're a solutionary. They've got some solutions. They've got some answers. Rachel was ministering last night, and her word was so in line with what uh, I was hearing for this. She read some of the same passages of Scripture. Because we're not just called to rise up and resist, though that we are to resist evil. But we're also called to have an option for the evil. We're called to, well, what is a pregnant young lady going to do then? She's 14 years old, 15 years old. Or someone who can't afford another child, they already have so many. What are they going to do? Well, the Blackshire family said, well, we'll just take one. We'll, ad we'll adopt one. The Hayes family said, we'll adopt two. The CPC that, I, that we support because we give financially to it, they said, well, we're going to help them uh, meet all their maternity needs, make sure they're, they're well cared for so that they have an option. We'll give them a sonogram. But we need some Christians. We need some people who believe there needs to be an option, not just, you can't do that. Well, what am I going to do? Well, here's something you can do. And so Jesus said, you're going to be that kind of a light. You're going to be a light that brings hope and a light that brings an option so that people don't have to be trapped or be captive in their sin and in what uh, the devil offers them. See, see society is, um, is a place where because of its, um, the issues and because of the, the blandness of life without God, the devil comes along with something that he says, this will spice up your life. This will make it more exciting. This will make it more, uh, uh, make you more happy. Um, and and uh, so you do this and you, you take this bottle and you take this pill and you get into that relationship because you deserve to be happy. Your Constitution even says that the Declaration of Independence says you have the right to pursue it. And so you deserve that. Even they recognize that, and God recognizes that. But see, uh, He gives you uh, options that uh, right around the corner is destruction. Right around the corner is death. And right around the corner is hurt and evil for, for your loved ones. <sighs> Excuse me. So, so the devil has these offerings, and we can't come with just something to say. Even, even Paul, when he wrote to the Ephesians, 
He didn't just tell them, now quit getting drunk on wine, did he? He didn't tell them that. He said, quit getting drunk on wine, get drunk on the Holy Ghost. He had an option. He said, be continuously being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why did he say that? Listen, there are some things, uh, I've been walking with the Lord long enough, that I, 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 there's things we can enjoy. You can't build a church on them, but you can enjoy them. And you need to know the difference. Uh, somebody said, well, he's so free. Uh, you know, you don't know when he's going to show up for the church service. This was the leader. And I said to the one, this was a national leader saying that to me. I said, well, you can't build a church that way. And they said, no, you can't. And the person that he's accountable to, they're dealing with that. Well, they weren't going to say that part until I said that. And so, um, so there's things you can, you, can be, you can be late. You can hang out because of things that happen and stuff. And there's no legalism about that. But, and you can enjoy obeying the Lord with a lot of spontaneity, and you need to. But in order to build a church, you have to have certain things you can count on. But, but we enjoyed some things over the years. I enjoyed services for about a month and a half, two months. Well, you didn't know when you came in there, it was like a bomb went off. And I'm telling you what, it was a, it was a, a, a brother that was trained in Rodney Howard Brown ministry, and he had that anointing. And when he laid his hand on you, we were talking about this last night, when he laid his hand on you, he had an anointing where you would forget everything. Oh, everything, your name. <clears throat> so these real prim and proper uh, professors of Bible colleges and stuff would come in, and all their hair, you know, the ladies' hairs were, hair was done perfectly and, and uh, dressed nice dresses and stuff, and they were going to just enjoy the service, you know. But what happened was he laid his hand on them, <laughs> and the Pentecostal anointing. <laughs> he said, well, uh, what do you do for a living? She said, I don't know. She was a professor. He said, where are you from? She said, I don't remember. He said, what's your name? She said, I don't know. <laughs> and she was, she was kind of giggling about it because it was puzzling to her why she didn't know. She always used to know, you know. And so her, he, her husband was laughing, you know, and so he called him up and put his hand on him. He said, what's your name? He goes, uh, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, in those kind of services, anything can happen. And so it ends up, and this might offend some of you, well, I'm sorry. There's people piled in the front like cordwood. And it's, forget catching. People are just falling on people. The catchers are falling on people. And everybody's so wackadoodled by the Holy Spirit that at the end, late at night, we're, we're pushing people out in wheelchairs because they can't walk. I literally put them into vans. We had ushers. Guess what, ushers? Maybe someday we would put them in the vans and drive them home, leave their cars at the church. They can't drive. And carry them in the house, lay them in their beds. Our associate pastor worship leader, I could say his name, he still, he still leads worship for a prominent church in town. I'll never forget this. He was laying down there and his shoes had come off and were over there somewhere and he'd got up and sit back on the front pew and his wife sat down beside him and he started going unbuttoning his shirt and she goes what are you doing he said I'm going to bed she said you're not at home he goes I'm not and uh but it was that crazy and I just wanted to say I just want to give you that example it's not something we should make it our goal or anything but if the Holy Spirit wants to blow in in Pentecostal power it can look strange it can look crazy and you say well I didn't know that's what I was praying for when I was praying for revival. Listen, every time you pray in tongues, you better, you don't even know what you're asking. And the Lord's saying, uh, in, uh, the Holy Spirit's praying for us in tongues, Lord, just deliver them of a binding, captivating dignity. Just deliver them of that. And so the Holy Spirit goes, okay, I know how to do that. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then you live with, because of the Pentecostal power, the salt and the light, you live with a stigma. People around town going, well, you know what happened to them? You know, I heard a lady bit a man on the leg down at the front. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. <laughs> Laying in those piles, I don't know, you know, but I missed a few what I was supposed to catch, and the lady's head hit the floor just like this. It sounded like a melon, and I thought, this woman's dead. 
and uh, she woke up and I kind of kept an eye on her and I said you okay she goes yeah I said you f your head okay she goes yeah don't feel nothing and so thank God praise God you know we're just worshiping the Lord praising the Lord because people are still alive after the service <laughs> but I'm saying just be open because you've got the Pentecostal anointing on you if and if you don't we're going to we're going to have it because we're asking the Lord for it we want a fellowship to be a hope fellowship we want it to be full of hope because there's a Pentecostal anointing that can break people free here's your here's your definition when Jesus started his ministry he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me and oh he's anointed Preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty them that are captive, and open the eyes of the blind, to make the lame walk. I'm telling you, I got the Pentecostal anointing. I don't know how Jesus said it, but he said, but I'm going to declare from now on the favor of the year of the Lord, the year of God's favor. And we're called with that same anointing to walk into situations that seem hopeless. So I'm here to declare favor on this favor on you favor on your on your children we sang it thank you Isaac again we sang it over our children and our grandchildren and generations for a thousand generations the favor of God because we release it because we can release it because we're anointed to release it Ephesians 5 6 8 he says let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of it, disobedience we can't forget that it's not just you know just it's not sloppy there's still a judgment there's still a disobedience that we need to avoid therefore do not be partakers with them he says for you were once darkness but now you are light in the Lord walk as children of the light he says in another place uh, well verse 11 right after that and have no fellowship with unfruitful words of darkness but rather expose them. Now that's where Jesus said, those that desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, some a prophet said, those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution because they hate the light. He said in John chapter 3, because their deeds, their evil deeds will be exposed. And so they love darkness. Sometimes people, Christians, who know the truth, who know that's wrong, know it's not right, you don't even have to give an explanation. You just have to say, look, I just want to tell you something. That movie star that said she's non-binary, meaning she's no gender, she needs counseling. There's something wrong with that, and you know that. You don't have to even be a Christian to know that. You just have to have somebody with enough guts to stand up and be the light and say, that's not right. But you will also be anointed with the power to endure the criticism and the persecution or the ostracize, they will ostracize you. Chuck Pierce said this. He said, we are in an era where we have to have the Spirit of God come on us. That seems so simple. But there were days where it seemed, there were, you know, in times past where it seems like society was closer to understanding or at least um, appreciating the the principles of of our constitution of our of the Judeo Christian writings. You know, the that a man marries a woman that was not even contested. And they were the worst sinners, but they didn't argue with that. Guys, I saw the other day. I mean, well, listen. If you're called to be a pastor today. You will counsel things I never dreamed I'd ever see. I read the other day where a man had his ears cut off because he was self-identifying as a parrot. Oh, yeah, he should be in an institution. But they have to call him by the right name or they get lose their jobs, uh, college professors and those who want to stand up and say, he's not a parrot, he's a man. Well... You don't get that right anymore. You, 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 uh, in the nation we live in, we're facing things. He says it's never going to come to us. Listen, in the Jackson Library, in the library, right over there a year or two ago, my mother-in-law took a sign and picketed it. They had drag queens reading the stories to the kindergartners, and the drag queen looked like horrible. 
Don't say it won't come to us. It'll come to us if we're not salt and light. And some of the things that we're dealing with came because the salt lost its savor. We thought we were supposed to stay out of politics because it was dirty, but it was dirty because we stayed out of it. And so now we're dealing with things that shouldn't have ever happened. Should never have been put in place. But the enemy does that. It just seems like overnight, all of a sudden you go, well, how did that, how did that person get to be president of the school council to, over what our, they put in CRT in, the, in, in our school? Um, is that what it's called? Critical race theory? Teaching our kids to hate our country? Um, teaching racism basically for all, you know, identify, uh, identifying and de de dividing everybody about everything. Putting it into the schools. How did, how did we get somebody in charge that's doing that? Oh, um, I remember. I didn't ever go to a meeting. I didn't ever go in and salt that council meeting. I didn't ever go in there and shine a light into that discussion. But that person stood up and said, hey, I got a good idea. This is an option from hell but he didn't say that part it's a demonic ideology but he didn't say that part and some uh, you know, non-discerning people so okay well that sounds good you know so we're dealing with that kind of thing I hope in this day and the kind of the things that I just referred to you're not um, watching current events unfold and getting fearful and hopeless if you are, please begin to view them through a Pentecostal anointing. And when you do, man, the opportunities to bring a shift and bring a change to that are so vast if the body of Christ will step into that. Isaiah 10, 27. You know what John 10, 27 says. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. That's precious. Isaiah 10, 27 says, It shall come to pass in that day. He's talking about the day of Pentecost. It's come to pass. That his burden will be taken away from your shoulder. The enemy's not going to be weighing us down anymore. His yoke will be taken from your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. The Pentecostal anointing is going to break off the yokes off this nation. It's going to break off the no yokes off our state, going to break them off of our school, going to break them off of individuals that we meet in the street. It's going to break them off because you go into that situation with the Pentecostal anointing, the ability to bring light, to bring flavor, to bring a shift, to release a wind, not just wait on the winds of change, but to be a wind of change because He dwells in you. The very change you're longing for is can be released by you into that situation. It's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, somebody was singing this this morning, I think maybe Bobby, but one of them was singing, therefore, we, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, we will not be shaken. We were singing that. Let us be thankful and so worship. Another translation says, serve God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Man, there's an anointing. It's going to burn up the things that are out of order, going to put into place the things that bring him pleasure. I'll close with this. Why don't you stand with me? Uh, it's what it's a, it's a, it's the uh, verses that Rachel read last night, in Romans chapter eight, verse fourteen, I think through nineteen. He says, "Those are led, that are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God." The Holy Spirit wants to lead you and give you revelation on how to be the salt and the light. If He'll if you'll let him lead you, he'll keep you on track. But he says, those that are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. He said, they have not received the spirit of bondage unto fear again, but one of adoption and sonship by which they cry, Abba, Father. And if they're children of God, they're heirs of God and heirs through Jesus Christ. So as heirs of Christ, we've received the same anointing, the same Pentecostal anointing. 
And we have the ability being led by the very one who put it on us in the first place, the Holy Spirit. We have the ability to release it where and how he says to release it. I said, Lord, how do I do it? He says, when you get there, do as the occasion demands. I said, Lord, that causes me to depend on you minute by minute, moment by moment. He goes, yeah. Yeah, it does. I go, man, I don't know. That's pretty risky. He says, yeah. (laughs) You know, you don't get a break with the Holy Spirit. Well, I thought he was the comforter. Well, he comforts you when you do these kind of things. Go ahead. You can do it. Come on, David. You can do it. You've got the Pentecostal one. Father, in Jesus' name, we receive today a fresh baptism, a fresh infilling, a fresh overflow, a fresh download, outpouring, whatever you want to call it, of the Pentecostal anointing. Let the Holy Spirit come, have His way with us today, this fellowship, our individual lives, our families. But we choose to surrender ourselves as an open vessel to the infilling of an anointing oil that will destroy yokes, set captives free, heal the lame, open eyes of the blind, and preach the gospel to those who are hungry and poor. In Jesus' name, we agreed with that and said amen. Amen. God bless you today. You have a Pentecostal anointed day. And if you need prayer, you come down and receive it today. Prophetic words.